Hey everyone, it's Rachel Wolfson here with Cointelegraph. Today I'm here with Henry Arslinian. He is the Senior Crypto Advisor at PwC. Hi Henry, how's it going? Great, great to see you again here in the beautiful Bahamas. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for joining us. It was a pleasure. So Henry, you've been heavily involved with regulatory issues surrounding crypto and helping draft legislation. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Well, you know, uh, as, as a lawyer, I think, frankly, I find crypto regulations a bit quite exciting, actually. Uh, but there's obviously been a lot of developments in the crypto ecosystem over the last couple of years. I think, you know, uh, three, four years ago, the crypto community, we were asking for more crypto uh, regulatory clarity, more, more policy clarity. And I'm happy to say that we're seeing now around the world, some jurisdictions now are coming forward and providing that level of clarity. The Bahamas here is a good example that really came out, provided crypto clarity. And now obviously we've seen the boom that it's happening. And we've seen that in other jurisdictions as well, not only in, in the Americas, but in the Middle East and Asia as well. So I think that's very, very exciting to see from that perspective. Right. And Henry, you helped draft some of the legislation here in the Bahamas, correct? Yeah, so I mean, I worked uh, in my uh, uh, PwC Global Crypto role. I worked obviously with many uh, regulators around the world. And I think what the, uh, about two, three years ago, the Bahamas embarked on this journey really to try to provide clarity to the market, uh, you know, and really pro provide them not only on a regulatory perspective, but on the policymaking perspective as well. And uh, I think the Bahamas has been a great example that if you build it, they will come. Or at least some of them may come. And uh, the ones that want to come are the ones that want to get regulated, the ones that want to abide by KYC email rules, the ones that want to abide by institutionalized uh, structures and frameworks in place. And I think this is going to be a great example of, uh, of why many companies have come here to the Bahamas. And I think for many other jurisdictions around the world, uh, I think Bahamas is a great example now of how if you build the proper regulatory setup, uh, others may come. And, you know, there's been other countries now that have been trying to do the same thing. The best example now is Dubai, for example, where right now you're seeing incredible number of attention, interest, and uh, movement of firms looking at setting up a presence there. Why? Because, again, there's been a very clear direction from not only regulators, but also policymakers that they want to um, uh, embrace crypto and they want to provide the proper regulatory framework with not only that is compliant, but also that provides for the particularities of the crypto industry. And that I think is a great step forward, not only for the future of crypto, but also the future of money. Right. So why are we seeing regulations and clarity um, develop in places like the Bahamas and Dubai versus places like the United States, for instance, where it seems like this is still kind of all coming together very slowly? You know, Rachel, it's very interesting. Just before this, I was moderating a panel with Chris Giancarlo, the former CFTC chairman, and I asked him, how would you rate from, a, from zero to 10 the crypto regulations in the U.S.? You know what was his answer? Zero. I was gonna say zero. So <laughs> it's very interesting to see that actually a lot of these actually jurisdictions have the agility, but also the, the will to actually embrace crypto and make it a very attractive place. Uh, and a lot of these jurisdictions are focused on the future. For example, if you go to a place like Dubai, they're really focused on the future right now, and they know that crypto is part of it. Uh, and it's also very difficult if you're, a, let's call it a legacy jurisdiction, and you know there's a lot of stakeholders, a lot of traditional finance stakeholders, a lot of stakeholders, let's say, that make money by being those intermediaries. Uh, obviously, they're all, many of them are embracing crypto now, but of course, it's not as uh, it didn't happen as quickly as many would have expected. So, the, a lot of these, ju these jurisdictions have this opportunity now to become global hubs like Dubai, like the Bahamas, and attract the tier one players to come into their jurisdiction. So I think that's very, very interesting to see as well. So can you give an example of some regulations that are being implemented in Dubai, for instance, that the United States could or should potentially um, mimic? First of all, I'd like to say, I think the United States, let's not forget, is a massive crypto ecosystem, right? Let's not forget that from listed companies, from investors, from a startup. So the ecosystem is very strong. I think you mentioned Dubai. Dubai, I think one thing that Dubai did very well is they announced the creation of what they call VARA, the, the Virtual Assets Regulatory Authority, which is a crypto specialized regulator. And whether you like it or not, when you're, at, you're specialized in certain industry, you know that vertical very well. And I think as a crypto community, as an ecosystem, I think it's you feel welcome somewhere where the regulator is specialized in what you're doing, but also that policymakers are telling you to come and actually, you know, uh, showing the red carpet. 
And I think this is going to be a big comparative advantage that places like Dubai have. And also, I mean, in the case of Dubai, you mentioned I mean, Dubai is obviously already a very global hub. Infrastructure is excellent. Uh, from a time zone perspective, you wake up in Dubai, you can do your Asia business. It's only four hours behind. During the Dubai time zone, you're doing your, your Middle East and European business. And the late afternoon, the U.S. wakes up and you can do your global business. So as a hub, and not, let's, not, let's not forget, you're one flight away from anywhere in the world, where uh, in a post-COVID environment, I think is very, very welcome as well. Right. Now, in terms of innovations that we're seeing, um, tokenization seems to be a big, big trend this year. What are your thoughts? You know, people seem to be tokenizing everything. What are your thoughts on tokenization? I think tokenization is very interesting. I'm very optimistic on the future of tokenization. However, uh, one thing that I'm looking at right now is how quickly this is going to happen. I think today, when you look at the whole uh, this tokenization space, look at security tokens, for example. Uh, I remember very well, 2019, 18, we were very optimistic on the future of security tokens. And many believe that in the next two years, this would have been a really big, very important uh, uh, vertical of crypto. But it didn't happen so quickly. And I would argue in many regards, it's been because the issuers, the ones issuing these tokens, uh, in many cases, didn't understand uh, security tokens. I'm not talking about crypto companies, but let's say real estate companies or companies that could tokenize their assets. And on the other side, it's been very difficult because um, it's been difficult for investors to understand how security tokens operate. You know, So I think that's been one of the things where I personally expected two, three years ago, the tokenization movement to happen faster mm. uh, than it is, it is today. Uh, that being said, I think other verticals of crypto have been really growing very, very fast. When you look at stable coins, for example, you look at even the fields of like the entry of institutional players, you look even topics like CBDCs that I think have really grown way quicker than uh, the token, tokenization mm -hmm. as, a, as a vertical. So institutions coming into the industry, that's really interesting. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm, I remain very bullish on the continuous entry of institutional players. And I think as an ecosystem, as a crypto community, we should welcome the entry of institutional players. Yes, many would say that actually these players are coming in. Many of them are centralized intermediaries. Many of them are like traditional finance. But I think in many regards, these, these centralized traditional players coming in uh, provide the level of, um, you know, kind of maturity and experience in dealing with institutional investors, uh, and I think which I think could be very, very beneficial to the crypto ecosystem. I'll give you a very simple example today. Any financial institution that you deal with has, for example, ISO certification. They have what we call SOC one, uh, you know, SOC one, SOC two, Type one, Type two. These are various certifications that have been around for 30, 40 years. And what's the benefit? These actually have been in place and they show that, you know, the checks and balances for our principles, policies, procedures, governance. These are all very boring topics. However, they're very, very important. Very good example, the Ron and Bridge hack that happened a couple of weeks ago. $600 million hacked. This was not a problem with the smart contract code, which as a community we know very well. This was a problem with the governance, the policies, how actually certain authorizations were given that were not withdrawn afterwards. And these are things that if we use some of the certifications and policies, frameworks we have developed over the last decades in the traditional financial world, as a community, as an ecosystem, we can benef benefit a lot. So this is why I remain very optimistic on the entry of institutional players. I think they'll be very beneficial. I think as a community, we should be more welcoming of, on the entry of institutional players as well. Right. So I'm also curious to hear your thoughts on Fidelity introducing, you know, the Bitcoin 401k. I think that's a step in the right direction. Uh, I think as an organization, Fidelity has been at the cutting edge, uh, not only of fintech, but also crypto for some time now. Uh, and I think it's a very positive development that we're seeing uh, in, the Philipp in the industry. I think everybody in the crypto ecosystem knew this was going to happen. The question is, when is this happening? You know, and uh, right now, the fact that we're seeing so many institutional players enter the space, right. uh, make a very active commitments in the space, uh, and do it in a very affirmative and relatively quick uh, uh, way, I think is very positive for mm -hmm. the crypto ecosystem. I think for us, the crypto ecosystem, to go from 1.0 to 2.0, we really need the entry of institutional players. Uh, not only because of the governance and the controls they bring and the institutional maturity they bring in, uh, but also in many regards, the capital as well. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget the organizations like Fidelity and many others you mentioned uh, really controls, you know, not only billions, but trillions of assets overall. And I think uh, having 1% of that come into the, to the crypto space will be very beneficial for the space. So. Now, is this a concept that we're already seeing in a place like Dubai? For, I mean, in the United States, this is, I mean, I feel like this is great. Yeah. In Dubai, is there, are there other um, firms doing this already? Bitcoin 401k or anything innovative like that? 
Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not. I think it's very difficult to know on a product by product perspective. And the beauty of crypto, as you know, many of these products are available around the world. Right. Yeah. I would say when it comes to B two C crypto products, uh, the US, I would argue, is generally ahead. If you look at some of the offerings, like the 401k offerings you mentioned, some of the offerings of being able to get paid in crypto, for example, a lot of these B two C providers that enable crypto. Uh, are actually, this is a very strong ecosystem in the U.S. Uh, where I'm seeing, I think every region, I'm seeing certain advantages in areas they're very strong in. Uh, for example, I think I'm, like you mentioned, Dubai, you know, is a great hub for any companies looking to operate as a hub. Dubai is perfect for that. Uh, if you're looking as a hub for for Asia, for example, places like Singapore and uh, to a certain extent Hong Kong, we're playing this role in, in the in the past as well. I think what's important to understand is over the last couple of months, there's been a lot of Post-COVID, during COVID, a lot of changes. Uh, you know, right now, if you want to address the Asian market, you cannot go to Hong Kong. Hong Kong is pretty de facto closed. Uh, unless you love doing hotel quarantines and, and God forbid, you get put the tested positive and you go sent to a government center, for example, right? But I think this is one thing we're seeing. A lot of these new hubs are being developed because they're able to take advantage of the situation in certain markets. Right. Um, now, what can we expect next from PwC? Obviously, PwC is one of the leaders in the crypto space for the big four firms. Um, so in terms of innovation. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned PwC's crypto. I remember when I launched the PwC crypto team in the late 2016. Uh, and now obviously it's grown to a team. There are over, we're over 400 people in 25 countries. Uh, I think the, the big four have still a very big role to play in the future of crypto. For example, at PwC, uh, the, the, you know, the, the purpose of the company is to build trust in society and solve important problems. And God knows there's a lot of demand for that in the crypto space. And I think for us, to uh, let the, the, the ecosystem as a whole uh, still needs, for the time being, trusted third parties that can come and provide this level of trust, comfort, and to a certain extent, institutional experience that can be very beneficial for the industry. I mentioned before areas like governance, controls, processes, procedures. These are areas where, for example, all the big four have tremendous experience dealing not only with uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies, but a lot of innovative companies over the years. And I think being able to bring this expertise to the crypto space is only positive. So next time, for a lot of people in the crypto ecosystem, you see people from the big four, from people from big consulting firms, they're not there because this is the, they think this, this, this is a new area they want to be in. I think there's a lot of value they can add to the ecosystem. So, I, you know, I think we should be welcoming to these organizations. Yeah. Great. Well, Henry, thank you so much. Thanks for having it's me. It's been Rachel. a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the good work you guys are thank doing. Thank you. Thank you.